All right. So calculations. Um, REDCap has capabilities of doing calculations for you. Uh, and just to show a brief example of what that would look like here, um, if we have a few examples of like, let's say procedures and we're trying to get a billing total for the procedures, you can add in a bunch of scores together and then REDCap is gonna automatically add those numbers together for you. And you can use this feature for a whole bunch of um, types of functionalities. You know, common ones that we see is calculating things like BMI, calculating uh, how old someone is at, the, at a certain point, at a visit date, maybe at a procedure date, um, calculating a score based on a survey. So if you're giving out like a, a survey to participants and it's like a common score, maybe a Charleston comorbidity score, maybe some kind of, uh, you know, postpartum score, who knows? Uh, any type of thing that may have a, a score associated with it, REDCap can calculate it for you on the fly so you don't have to spend any time uh, you know, doing it yourself, um, at least once it's programmed in and we'll show how that works today. Um, so this is kind of just the main thing that we're looking at here is how to get REDCap to automatically do certain things for us, like adding things together and cal those calculations for scores and systems. Um, we're also going to take the uh, similar, I guess, layout of calculations and show you how to apply that to other parts of the project. So uh, calculations are going to use a lot of things called variables, which we'll uh, go over in just a few moments. Um, and variables can be used and calculations can be used in other types of formats. So you may want uh, to calculate a report uh, and a, reports that, uh, a report that's only going to show patients who, let's say, have uh, a, a total cost for their visit over $6,000. Maybe you just want a report that has that, or you want a report that shows only patients who are, um, you know, over a certain age, or maybe patients who had a lab value that was either above or below a certain value. Uh, and then you can narrow down your entire data set and get kind of sub-reports uh, that kind of match your reporting needs. Uh, REDCap does have some of that functionality. And you can also apply what we're going to be talking about today to uh, surveys. So things like how to um, set up surveys to go out under certain conditions. Like I only want surveys to go out under uh, a condition where uh, patients have, let's say, abstract lab values. So if they're under a certain uh, amount or over a certain amount, then notify a physician or send out a survey to participants who um, marked a box that said, you know, they are at risk for something else, then maybe they need to get a follow-up survey. Uh, so we'll talk about those kind of conditions as well. So that being the case, let's jump in and let's talk about calculations and how they work. Um, so starting from the uh, beginning here, where you're talking about variable names. And so when you're creating questions, like you see here on the screen, like billable amount for procedure one, billable amount for procedure two, name, email, every single for every single question that you make in REDCap, uh, they always have a variable name associated with them here. So like name um, has this variable called pat name. Um, and email has a variable called pat email uh, that is set up by you when you create the question. And REDCap uses these variables to take that information and use it in either calculations, piping, branching logic, anything like that. Um, and the best way to think of a variable uh, is similar to uh, kind of like an algebra equation where you have like x, y, and z as variables. And so if you're adding together x, y, and z, uh, the totals of those variables are going to give you the grand total. Uh, and the same way, uh, REDCap has these variables, like in this case here for procedure 1, I called it PROC1. For procedure 2, I've called it PROC2. And procedure 3, I've called it PROC3. So that can be similar to our x, y, and z. And then we would tell REDCap to add together the scores of x, y, and z and get our total like we saw before. Um, and the way that looks in a calculation is like this. There we are. Let me center that a little bit here. There we go. Cool. So I'm taking all of my variables, PROC1, PROC2, and PROC3, and simply adding them together uh, in a calculated field. So uh, I'll show this from scratch, too, to show how you create one of these guys and, and make them. Um, but this is kind of the gist here, where you take the variable names, you surround the variable names in, in brackets. Uh, so like PROC1 here, I just put in brackets. And I say, what do I want to do with it? I want to add it to the variable of PROC2, and then I want to add it to the variable of PROC3. Uh, and then I would get my total once all those pieces of data are entered. Um, so to show how that's built, let me uh, just erase this field, and we'll build it from scratch. 
So let's say I have my three qu questions already created here, my PROC1, PROC2, and PROC3, and then I add my field. Um, when doing any type of addition or calculation, I choose a calculated field from my field type. So uh, out of those choices there, I'm gonna go to calculated field to get a total score, and I'll call this total uh, procedure cost. And then from my calculation underneath here, I'll click on this empty space, and that's gonna bring me into my calculation editor, or as RedCamp calls it, the logic editor. And this is where I can start writing in my, uh, my calculation. So I'll open up a bracket, and then as soon as I open up a bracket, it's gonna show me all the variables in my project. Uh, so I can scroll through all of them, but in this case here, what I'm interested in is the PROC1. So taking PROC1 and then adding that to PROC2, and then adding that to PROC3, just like such. And as you're adding in these variables and adding things to the calculation, REDCap will tell you if it's valid or not, uh, meaning that it understands the syntax that you're working with. So for example, if I forget a, uh, a bracket at some point, um, oops, let's say I go in there and forget a bracket, uh, it will not give me that this is valid. Uh, it'll just give me a little blank there. Um, so if I do add my bracket back in there, be like, yep, okay, I can understand what you're working with. Um, so that's a good uh, check here. It does not necessarily mean that it's going to work 100% of the time, but it does mean that it is formatted in a way that RedCap understands. I think here it says the ter determination of valid uh, validity may not be 100% accurate in all contexts. So that's a little disclaimer there. Cool, so that's the calculation. Um, so I'll call this total for the proc, and I'll add that field in. And now we have our total procedure cost, which is adding these three together. And you can always review the equation again by clicking on view equation, and you'd be able to see what that calculation looks like. And so once again, going back in, if I were to add in uh, a new record, I can then do the same thing, so 500, 700, and 300, and we get 1,500 as our total. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, kind of how that relates to multiple choice questions. So we have basic addition here that we just showed, which has this kind of uh, format to it. Um, but there is a, a few other things to look at when talking about multiple choice questions. So in this case here, we have a multiple choice question. You can think of this as like, let's say, you know, it's the same kind of question here. We have the procedure one cost, procedure two cost, procedure three cost. So let's say instead of typing in the, the billable amounts, we're gonna select them from a, uh, from a drop down menu here or from this uh, radio button menu. Um, and I still wanna get the overall total at the bottom. So you will notice something interesting here, though, is that as I select, let's say the, the first procedure is $2,800, the second procedure is $4,900, and the third procedure is $2,883. Uh, but for some reason, our total is showing up as seven here on the bottom. Um, why would that be? Hmm. <laughs> um, and as you change the numbers here, you'll also see that the numbers change a little bit on the bottom, but it's not reflecting the numbers that I'm interested in. But uh, why is that? So this is something I wanted to show because uh, it relates to calculating things on um, like forms for uh, a score. And so let me scroll down here to the, the designer mode and we have our procedure. So this is exactly what we're looking at just on the design side. Uh, and our equation is pretty much the exact same thing as before. We're just taking these three variables and adding them together. Granted, the variable names are a little bit different because in this case I chose PROC1 RB, PROC2 RB, and PROC3 RB. Um, and the equation is simply adding those three together. Uh, the thing to note when doing multiple choice question addition versus free text addition like you, that we saw on the top is that multiple choice question addition is only going to add together the code value associated with your items. So in this case here, even though I had 1,829 as my dollar amount, the code was only set as number one. So when adding that up, it's only gonna add a plus one or a plus three or a plus four, whatever was selected. So as we saw here, this would represent a plus one, this would be a plus two, and this is a plus two, giving us our total of five. Um, so when doing things that are multiple choice questions, or like if you're scoring something, um, the number that's being added is this code here. If I wanted to make 
my codes uh, add up to the correct total, I can just change my codes to the actual value. Uh, so 2283, and these codes are similar to like multiple choice question codes where it's like, you know, A, B, C, and D, but in REDCap, it does not care if they're in any specific order or not, uh, or what the number is, as long as they're all different. So in this case here, if I make my codes, uh, instead of 1, 2, 3, and 4, I make them equal to their dollar amount, um, REDCap will now add those codes together. So 1829, 2883, 4933, and 9923. And let's go here. One more. 29, 2883, 4933, 9923. And if I save this and return back to our calculation, let's see if that adds up correctly now. So 2800, 1829, and 4933. Three. That seems like uh, that is more correct. Cool. Um, any questions on this so far? Oh, looks like a chat menu here. Oh, sorry, I just missed a, a few of these. Sorry about that. Uh, let me take a look. Um, REDCap shows you all the variables, not just the ones designated as a as calculable fields. Uh, yes, it will show you every variable um, in that particular view. So if I go back to the designer, let's see here, and if I open up my brackets here, this is going to show me every single variable uh, within my project. And there also are some smart variables, um, like this here, uh, which are available for you as well. Um, this course doesn't specifically go over smart variables, but if we have a few t moments at the end, uh, we can work on that. Another question that says, is the calculated answer always in red or can it be changed? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, something tells me it is always in red. Uh, um, to my knowledge, it is always in red, but I will look up that afterwards just to see if there's any other options for that, but I have not seen another option for their color yet. Um, another question that came in that says, how do you get uh, the form view to test out if the calculations work as expected? That's a great question. Uh, when testing out calculations, you have to add a record uh, to the project. So just even as a test record, you can do add edit records here and add a sample patient and then you can test the calculation. Um, on the design form, there is this thing that says preview instrument, but this doesn't actually let you test the calculations. Actually, I I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Let's try it. Yeah, um, so the preview instrument does not work. You'd have to go in and add actually a sample record to test it out. Great question. All right. Um, give me one moment. Okay, so that's a little example. Um, I want to build out one real quick that just so, shows a similar use case of why you might want to use that and keep the code similar. So I'm going to build out a very quick, um, like just a scoring system. Let's just say like, a, you know, how many times do you exercise? Uh, how many times do you exercise a week? And then for the choices, we're going to make our choices the scores, remember. So we're not going to just use uh, one, two, three. Uh, these codes are going to be our, our scores. So let's say we'll give a score of 10 if they work out uh, every day. We'll give a score of 7 if it's every other day. Uh, we'll give a score of 3 if it's uh, once or twice a week. Uh, and then we'll give a score of 1 if it's never. Exercise. Okay. Um, and so that would be uh, the choices with the associated scores. And let's just do one more um, of like, let's say how many hours of sleep do you get a night? And we'll do the same thing. We'll have a score of uh, eight for eight hours. We'll have a score of five if they get between six and eight hours. Um, we'll do a score of three if they have uh, less than six hours, something like that. And uh, just like that, you can now have your form and have it calculate those together. So if I wanted to add exercise and sleep together, I would do the same thing, add a new calculated field, 
uh, and we'll call this, uh, we'll call it the health score, and we'll just add our exercise by opening that bracket, typing in the variable name, and I want to add that score to whatever the score for sleep was. And I can save that, and we'll call it, uh, we'll call it the health score. And if we test it out uh, by adding a test patient here, add a new record, let's say how many times do you exercise a week, let's say every other day, and they get, let's say, six to eight hours of sleep, and they have the health score of 12. Um, so that's a way that you can create a full form and then generate these scores automatically. Cool. Hopefully that, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, Let's see, another question has come in that says, can you use the results of a calculated field on a new calculated field? And can you use them across different instruments? Uh, that is also a great question. Uh, yes, you can. So let's say, for example, we wanted to add uh, these two together, the total procedure costs for this first section and the total procedure costs for the second section. We can add that into a third altogether. So let's say um, we have a calculated field here. And let me see what those variable names were. So my first calculated calculation was total proc. And I want to add that final bit to uh, my drop-down variable that I made here. So let's give that a try. We'll call it total proc plus, I think it was drop-down. Let's do total calc. Total procedures. All right. Now let's give that a refresh and let's see if that works. So if we had, let's say that and that and that, there's our total. And then we add our total here. We should have, um, let's see, 8,011. Uh-oh. Did I break it? Hmm. I might have broken it. Let's see, what did I do? Total proc. Oh, I made edits to this. No, that's correct. And then this. Aha, that's what it was. So somehow this got messed up. Proc 1RB, the variable names got changed here. So proc 1RB plus proc 2RB plus proc 3RB and save. Okay. Yeah, I think I might have been typing something in the wrong place. Let's try it again and just make sure that that's possible. So we have that and that's a 6,000 there. Wow, nice job hitting that on the dot. Nice. And then there's 8,000 there, and then together they have 14,000. So yep, uh, you can use them uh, to combine with each other. Uh, another uh, question has come in that says, uh, it's advisable to use the sum function when adding values to avoid issues with blank fields. Uh, that is also a really good point too. Um, so what that comment is uh, relating to here is that if you have a blank value, like for procedure one, two, and three, and there's a blank in here, you'll see that there is no total. It will wait till I either put in a zero or put in any kind of value. Um, to avoid uh, a missing value breaking the whole equation, uh, there is a similar function that you can use in red cap. So let me pull that up here that does the exact same thing. So this is what we were looking at before, uh, proc1 plus proc2 plus proc3. Uh, and if you check under this little blue button here that says special functions, and you'll see the special functions uh, in a lot of different places. So even here in the designer, you'll see this blue special functions right on the top. Um, but also in the calculated field section, you'll see this spot for special functions. Uh, and in the logic editor, you'll see that button a lot of places. And the special functions is kind of a cheat sheet for all the different kinds of calculations that are available and all the different functions that are available within REDCap. So uh, not just addition, but you also have things like um, square root, exponents, absolute values, minimum, maximums, means, sums, and things like that. And they give you the format um, that it's looking for here. So if we wanted to use a sum function, um, right here, we'll see that it's uh, used the word sum and then uh, everything that you want to sum together, you put in parentheses 
right next to it, uh, separated by commas. So just reading that off um, like this here. It looks like there's another example uh, in the text here uh, that I'll just copy and paste as a little cheat sheet. So I can copy that, and I'll just leave it here as something to look at while I'm uh, writing out a sum function. So if I do sum, and then the same thing that I was looking for, so proc1, comma, proc2, comma, proc3, and then end it with that final parentheses like we see here. That would do the same exact thing as our existing function. So if I removed all that, we now have a sum function in there. Um, and if I try it out, this will uh, alleviate the issue from having uh, blank, it, blank fields cause any breaks. So you can see now the 588 shows up as the total procedure cost. And if I add a second value in there, uh, it'll add up. And I do not need to have anything for my third value. So that is a, a benefit of the sum function. Um, and the same thing with average functions and things like that. So uh, if you wanted to add an average or a mean, uh, maximum, things like that. Uh, one other thing to note with calculations is that calculations are specific only to that individual record. Um, so you cannot take averages between all patients. You can only do an average for one patient uh, and the, the data within one patient. Um, REDCap is coming out with additional functionality uh, probably in the next couple of months that will let you do aggregate functions across the board for all of your patients. Uh, so stay tuned for that and we'll definitely have courses on that when that becomes available. Um, the next thing I want to show is uh, calculations of age and dates. That's also a, a, a big function here. So a lot of times you'll see people looking for, uh, you know, how old was someone at a certain date or how many days are between two certain events. Uh, you can also do that calculation in REDCap. So uh, let's say we had an appointment date of today and we wanted to calculate uh, how old somebody was at their appointment. So let's say we go, wow, 35, uh, 86 years old, uh, 0.4049562, yada, yada, yada. So you get a lot of decimals there, but it does calculate the difference between uh, the two dates. And we'll definitely talk about how to shrink those, those decimals because you're not, you're not gonna want those decimals. Um, but I wanna show this calculation first and how it works. So like we were shown before, there's the special functions button. And the special functions button is a really good reference. And I say references, reference it as often as you can um, to just try and get you know, a feel for all these different kinds of uh, available functions within REDCap. Uh, the one that we're interested in is uh, this date diff function here, which says calculate the difference between do two dates or date times. Um, and this is the actual function itself. Um, and there's a few examples that they give on the top too. So like this is how you would calculate the number of days separating today's date uh, and a date time field uh, and a date or date time fields value in the past or future. It kind of uses this functionality here. Um, how to calculate how to calculate a person's age uh, based on date of birth. They have this little example here. And these are great reference points. So um, I'll take a couple of these out and just kind of show the uh, process here of what we're looking at. Okay, so I'm taking the date diff from the cheat sheet. And what I also sometimes like to do is uh, just go over like the text here because they give quite a, a large explanation of um, what the function does and how it's used. Sometimes it's a little dense to read, but um, it does have good information in here. So what we're looking at uh, is all the information for uh, calculating two dates together. So this is the main function that I've used right now that makes this particular thing work. We're just taking the appointment date and the birth date and adding them together, or subtracting them and getting that age. And it's using this function date diff where I open the parentheses and I put in the first date that I want to compare. So APP date is the appointment date, which is the variable name for this field. And then I have my DOB, which is the variable name for the birthday. So appointment date, comma, DOB, comma, and I have a Y here to result in years. Um, 
And to explain this further, this is the uh, equation that you get in the special functions here. So it's saying use the date diff. You're going to put in your first date and then a comma. Then you're going to put in your second date you want to compare it to and then a comma. And then you're going to put the units that you're interested in. So in this case, we wanted to get it in years, but we could also get it in months or days or minutes or things like that. And then this last thing here is a return sign value. And that's just saying, do you want to take the absolute value of the result or not? And uh, this would only be useful in cases where you might have negative days. So it's saying maybe like you want to calculate how many days until someone's appointment or, or how many days has it been since someone's appointment. And it might say negative two days if you know they're uh, scheduled to come in in two days. Um, or if it's afterwards, you might have a positive two or a negative two, however you want to decide uh, that to work if you're comparing those. But... Um, Interpreting this and the uh, text that was given here, and once again, this is all being pulled from that cheat sheet. So like we have here uh, the date diff, date diff, and then here is the cheat sheet uh, definition. Um, it's giving us a few options. So when it asks for units, uh, we see here in the cheat sheet, it says your options for units are lowercase y, which is years, and it gives you uh, that functionality. You have this capital M for months, uh, and then the lowercase d for days. So if I want to know how many days were between the appointment date and the date of birth, I can put it in uh, a lowercase d there and I'll get it in days. Um, but in this case, I'll stick with uh, my lowercase y for years. And then you'll also see this uh, one more comma after units where it says return sign value. And the return sign value uh, is described in the explanation as well. It says the return sign value must either be true or false and denotes whether you want the re result returned um, to either uh, be signed or unsigned. And this is just saying uh, it's the absolute value. Um, the reason why my equation still works without that return sign value is because it also mentions it here. If the return sign value section is not set, or is set to false, the result will always be a positive number. So in this case here, uh, no one can have a negative age, so I can leave uh, off the return sign value, and it's saying here I'm always going to get a positive number if it's not set to anything. So in this case it's not set, um, and therefore the age is always going to be positive. So I know that's a lot. Um, I want to show it in practice uh, once just to kind of show you how that works and how we would create that. So let's create something that, that calculates uh, maybe how many, let's say a length of stay uh, for a patient. So uh, from scratch, I'm going to make a new field here and we'll call it uh, admission date. One other thing to note too is that you uh, make sure to validate your dates as uh, whichever format you prefer. Um, and they have to have matching formats, so a month, day, year, and the same thing uh, for uh, a discharge date or whatever date that you're looking at. So discharge date, and I'll call it uh, discharge date, and the same thing, I'm going to validate that as a month, day, year format. So we have these guys here. I'm just going to add a little section header in there that says uh, length of stay, just to divvy up the form a little bit. And now let's calculate these together. So I'm making notes of the variable names and the other variable name here, the discharge date and the admission date. And I'm going to create a new field for calculations. So calculated field, and let's call it length of stay. And then for the equation, I'm going to go back to my cheat sheet, bring it in there and then follow this kind of format. So, okay, uh, I'm just following what I have here in the cheat sheet. So date diff, opening my parentheses, the first date that I want to compare is the date, uh, or was it admission date, I think? Admission date, perfect. And then still following along the cheat sheet, I have a comma, and the second date I want is the discharge date. And the third item is my units, and um, once again, in the cheat sheet, it defines all the units here, and I have my lowercase y, so I'll use that for, uh, actually in this case, we don't want years, we actually want it in days, so I'll be taking uh, this lowercase d in days, so uh, comma d for days. And then the return sign value, um, the options for that are either true or false. 
uh, or I can just omit it. So if the return sign value is set to, uh, let's see, if the return sign value is set to false or not set, then the order uh, of the dates. Okay, wait, wait, where was that? Uh, doo, 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 doo. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I could have sworn it said that, you know, if it's not set, but it, you guys are probably reading it, and I'm, I just can't see it right here. But somewhere in here it says, you know, if it's not set, um, then it will always result in a positive date. But the same thing, we can also set it to false. Uh, so if I do a comma and then a false, uh, then it should also say it's okay but in this case oh actually yep that should be good it's saying there's an error in syntax right now because I I just copied and pasted the cheat sheet but as soon as I remove that it should be good to go so let's take a look let's see if we got it uh, we'll call it LOS for length of stay let's see uh, calculation error exists there's a syntactical error in the calculation field interesting. Sometimes it gets picky. I'm not sure why it does this sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't like the false at the end if it if it's going to be uh, positive. Let me see if let me see if that helps. Yeah, now we don't get an error. I'm not sure why, but that last little bit there, that's kind of like a underground secret, the uh, <laughs> uh, the true false in the date diff sometimes is necessary, sometimes isn't. Not sure why. I think uh, it doesn't really like the false. It might like the true, but I'm not going to go too much into that now. But I'm just going to omit that because uh, say it says if it's omitted, uh, it'll always be positive, and that's good enough for me. Um, so let's return here, and let's check out this here. Let's say there we are. So if they stayed for from today until the 30th, uh, that would be two days as the length of stay. Okay. <laughs> oh, so that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. Let's see uh, any questions have come in. Looks like we have here. Uh, does REDCap have the uh, capacity to use timestamps in calculations? Uh, so times is in minutes and seconds. Uh, yes, it does. So you can do the same kind of calculations with minutes and seconds uh, to get those uh, uh, results there. Um, can calculate and you use the same kind of format that we went through. So instead of the results being days, you can set the result to minutes, um, and that would work. Uh, can calculations have multiple time calcs in the same line? For example, days and hours between two date and times. Um, that cannot be done. Uh, so you cannot have it was this many days and this many hours uh, in one particular uh, field. Um, but what you could do is that if you were to uh, separate the collection, you could do uh, day and time. So for example, if you had uh, a field that had admission date and then a separate field that was admission time and set the time function uh, to this like uh, hours, hours, minutes, minutes right here, uh, and then do the same thing for a discharge time. So you'd be collecting that in two separate places, so the date and time. You can then do two separate calculations and then uh, link them together to have the, the value that you're looking for, where you'll have a date, you know, then a space, then a time afterwards. Um, but if you have a combo field that's a month, a year, time, time, you're going to get uh, uh, like uh, a decimal place afterwards. So if it's like, you know, it's been three days and point so-and-so minutes. Um, cool, I hope that answered the question. Uh, another question that came in says, in this example, can you use uh, the date diff function to return a value that also includes the admission day as part of the length of stay? Um, three days including 727, 729, and 730. Ooh, that's... That's a good question. I think in that case, um, 
Huh, that's actually a really good question. So the answer would be, th oh, what you could do for that is uh, you could just add one. So you would have the uh, date diff here, uh, and then after all of this, you can just do a plus one at the end. So uh, if I just did plus one, then that would count for the third day uh, if I wanted to include the 28th. Um, so in that case here, let's see if I go back to uh, my sample. So you guys have really good questions today. This is great. Um, so if you have the mission day, and let's say it was the 30th, uh, now that would be three days total. That's a great question. Cool, cool, great. Um, awesome, I hope that answers everyone's question. If I missed any of them, uh, please just submit it again. I think I'm up to speed there. Uh, just let me know. Alrighty. Cool. Let's see. Next up, what I'd like to talk about is um, let's see, let's see. Let's talk about using calculations in branching logic. Because I know that we mentioned that. Let's see what else we had on the agenda. I, I don't think we'll get be able to get through all of these. We did talk about uh, scoring so far. <laughs> That's all we talked about. Um, well, let's talk about branching, and then uh, we'll get from there and just kind of show some applications of this in other situations. So uh, let's say for branching, we're interested in um, doing a multi-branch selection uh, based on labs. So let's get a lab value uh, in this form. I'm actually just going to create a new form for labs. So we'll call it labs. All right, and in here, let's take a lab value. Whatever kind of lab, lab one, sure. And we'll make the result uh, a number. So whatever lab this is, take your favorite pick. Uh, it's, it's, it's whatever lab you like. But in this case here, I want to use branching logic uh, to, and br branching logic, if you're not familiar, is the way of like showing and hiding fields based on certain conditions. So in RedCap, uh, you could make your forms very dynamic. I like to show off our RedCap support ticket, um, where depending on what you select, you get uh, uh, new fields that show up. So for example, if you have a login issue for RedCap, uh, then this page will show up. If you have a, um, Let's say you need to con uh, convert some images or consent forms, and this page will show up. If you need to do something else, you're getting the point here where you can see the whatever you select, new things are going to show themselves, uh, and that's what branching logic does. So it uh, kind of picks and chooses what should be shown based on certain criteria. Um, and let's say in this case here, when you're entering a lab value into REDCap, you might want some kind of warning to show up if a lab value is over or under a certain range. So that's what I want to show here and uh, make a kind of alert pop up when a lab value is, let's say, less than 100 or greater than 1,000. Let's say those are outside of our range. So the first thing I want to do is create uh, that alert. So we'll make an alert here that says, uh, you know, lab value is outside of expected range, something like that. Okay, and we'll just call it warn. And we'll you know, add some exclamation points in there, make it all sorts of dramatic. There we go. And now we want to add in branching logic uh, to make this show up only under certain conditions. So um, if I add branching logic, and branching logic is added through this little uh, two-way arrow stream here, and it's giving conditions to this specific question on when, or the specific you know, alert in this case, sometimes it could be a question, uh, on when it should and should not show up. So I'm going to say, okay, these are the conditions for you on when you should and should not show up. So I want this field to only show up in the case where lab 1 is, let's say, less than 100, or lab 1 is greater than 1,000. So those are the two conditions. And once again, lab 1 is the variable name that I chose for the lab. And you can, once again, think of this as an algebra, where this is a similar to an x. Uh, and this is also the same thing as x. So if, if x is less than 100, or if x is greater than 1,000, then that's going to trigger this to work. Um, so uh, let me save that. 
and I'm using this or function uh, to say that it you know has to be one or the other. Um, and I can add in multiple, uh, or if it's, I don't even know what would work in this situation here, I already have greater than less than. <laughs> Maybe let's say if it hits exactly 500, uh, it's also a problem. <laughs> so, or if lab is equal to exactly 500, then that's a problem too. Uh, I'm not sure that there would, I don't think that would ever be a case, but uh, let's just for practice problems here, let's work with it. So those are our conditions, and if any of these conditions are met, so either uh, x is less than 100, x is greater than 1,000, or x is 500, then it's going to trigger that logic. So let's go um, into our sample and take a look. So this is the warning. You can see that now the branching logic is attached to the warning, and it shows the conditions right there in the builder. So let's add that field in. I'm going to go into my labs here. So if I add a lab of 430, 433, no problems, things are good, great. If I add a lab of 100, should be okay. Uh, and you saw that warning pop up real quick there because it thought that I entered 10, and it's very dynamic with it. So if I entered 10, it's like, uh-oh, mm -mm. This is also a great thing in case of typos. Someone might forget a zero. Boom. Uh, that's a nice warning there. Um, if it's exactly 500, I think that was also a criteria. Uh, 1,000 should be okay, but 1,001 might not be okay. There we are. Uh, lab values outside of expected range. So that's one of the ways that you can use that kind of calculation uh, functionality to uh, utilize it in branching logic and give a little extra oomph uh, to your projects. And you can set up a lot of different warnings or like alerts or things like that. Actually, let me show you a really cool thing here. Um, let's see. I want to show you one of our projects that we currently work on. Um, and if I had a record here, the context isn't so important here, but uh, we can see that we have a lot of different alerts here uh, on the top of our form. And depending on what people select um, or what happens in the form, our alerts will change. So in this case here, where the box link field is, if something is entered there, then my warning goes away. If I remove that, then my warning comes back. Um, if uh, people are collecting PHI, then uh, I have a warning here on the top that gives me like kind of alerts like visually when the first thing I come into my form I have all of these alerts right there on the top and I can quickly see okay this is how I need to treat this whole uh, form. Um, so that's kind of a cool use case that you can use branching logic for to kind of like show and hide things. If you're interested in doing something like that uh, I'm not going to cover it in this course but just feel free to shoot us a line afterwards and I'm happy to work with you that cause it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool to do a little little kind of notifications, a little heads up display. Um, I think a question came in Let's see, uh, does this work with dates as well? Uh, yes, it should work with dates, um, where you can do a, a date value and then it has to be greater than uh, another certain date. Uh, let's actually see that, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I've tried it with late. Uh, let's say lab date instead. So date here, and let's say lab one. Lab one is greater than, oh, what's the format in red cap? Month, day, year, 01, 01, 21. Actually, let's, let's test that out. I don't think this is gonna work right away, but let me see. I think it needs a four digit year, that's why. Uh, oh, yes, there it is, actually. Let's say if, if we went to 20, Nope, doesn't work. Okay. Hmm, dates might be something else. Okay. It might have to be a two-step thing with dates. I'll have to play around with that a little bit more because uh, you can create a calculated field like we did before, um, and you could base the measurement off the result of that calculation. So, for example, uh, what we were looking at before is... this, 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 um, like this here. If you have an admission date and let's say they discharge on uh, this day, then you have a three and then you can set the warning based off of this final value here. It says show the warning if the length of stay is greater than three, something like that. Uh, so that would be a workaround. Uh, I'll still look into the dates for you uh, if they're comparable directly. I'm not sure, but uh, you can do it via one more step of doing a calculation. 
Uh, another question that's coming in says, is there a way only the editor can see the branching logic message? For example, if a patient is completing this form and we did not want them to see the warning message, that is a great question. Um, this kind of goes a little bit outside of this course, but I, that is pretty good uh, as a question there, so we're gonna show it here. This is uh, doable under action tags. Um, so action tags give a little extra functionality, and uh, one of the functionalities is you can hide certain things from certain people. Um, and I'm getting to the menu by uh, being in the, the question, and then going to this little red button that says action tags, and then in here there's a few options to hide things from certain folks. Um, so in this case here, what you'd be interested in is in this at hidden survey. So the warning message will not show up on the survey. It'll only show up on the form view. And the form view is typically only going to be for uh, the clinicians or people on the inside that can uh, see those warnings. Uh, from the survey perspective, uh, typically a patient will not see that. So in this case here, I could hit add hidden, at hidden survey. And then um, if that were to be a survey, uh, the participants will never see it. So for example, if I just set this up real quick here, let's go in to someone's record and from the um, clinical view, you can see the warning here, but if a patient were to see this, like from a something at home, you can see that they don't receive the warning even though it's the same value, uh, but the clin clinicians will see that. So uh, that's how you would do that. That is, once again, the action tags. Um, they are done through uh, the designer mode. And then when you're on the form, you add the action tags in on the bottom left there. Great question, great question. Um, cool, let me see what else we got here. Uh, some piping. Uh, piping is always cool. I just want to show that real quick. And then survey conditions, reporting conditions. Ooh, these are all good. Um, I guess we'll briefly touch on everything. So let's talk about the surveys real quick. So uh, you're probably familiar, but if you're not, REDCap does have the ability to send out automatic survey invitations. So like labs here and forms, anything that you have marked as a survey, there's this ability to automate uh, the surveys going out. So I can uh, click on automate here, and then I get this uh, window that lets me automate uh, a survey. So as usual, you can set up the message and be like, you know, this is a automated notice, something like that. For step one. And then step two is the condition. This is where this stuff will translate um, to where we are now. So let's say we wanted to send out a follow-up survey maybe to the to the labs saying like, hey, can you give me more information about why this lab was over uh, a certain value? Or, you know, can you, you know, comment further on if you noticed anything else wrong with any of the patients, like, you know, a, let's say a lab value is over and they go to the lab and say, hey, can you tell me if there's anything else wrong with any of the tissue samples they might have or something like that. Um, and you can set up logic conditions that will automatically schedule uh, some kind of form or some kind of notification to go out. So under uh, my conditions here, I can use that kind of same functionality I was looking at to set up the conditions. So send out the survey in the case that lab one is less than 100 or lab uh, one is greater than a thousand. Um, and so REDCap will check that and keep that in mind when you when setting out these automated forms. And if anyone has a normal lab value, uh, no survey goes out. But if someone has a, uh, an abnormal lab value, then automatically REDCap is going to notify the people who need to be notified like, hey, you know, strange lab value came up, it's outside the range, here's your notice. Uh, so that's a, a great way of utilizing that uh, within surveys, that same kind of logic. And in the same way, the same stuff goes for reporting. So if you're creating custom reports uh, under the data exports reports and stats, uh, I'm not sure if you guys were able to see the course, I think it was last week that we did on reporting. It's got the same kind of functionality in here. You can create a custom report, just being like, hey, I want to see all, all, I want to see all the patients that have an abnormal lab value. Uh, and you can use it in step three here where the filters are for reporting. And the same exact thing you can do, like, you know, I want to see where lab one is less than 100 or lab one is greater than a thousand. And what that's going to do is filter out uh, all the patients that meet that criteria. So if you have a, a project of 10,000 patients, you might have you know, 65 with abnormal lab values. Uh, and this is a great way of using those filters to uh, get you a very condensed report. Cool. 
Uh, another question came in that says, uh, can you show one more time where the automated survey invitation option was? Yeah, absolutely. So this is located in the designer right here. And then from the designer, there is the automated invitations. Uh, you will only see this for your forms that are marked as a survey. Uh, so um, you can only automate uh, surveys. If you, uh, yeah, so if that's, that's if you want to set up conditions to send out a survey to somebody. Um, if you just want to send out an alert to somebody without any survey attached, uh, that's done under this menu here, alerts and notifications. So depending on if you want to have someone fill out a form or if you just want to give them notice, you would use one or the other. Hopefully that helps. Um, if you do not see any of these options here, uh, like enabled as a survey, like if this is not here at all, um, that is because uh, you need to enable surveys in your project to start off with in the setup. So by default, REDCap doesn't let you use surveys. You just have to uh, toggle this little switch on uh, from the project setup menu that says, yes, I want to use surveys. And then once that yes is there, you'll get these options.